Oi bine cuvânta pe Domnul în orice vreme. Lada lui va fi totia una în gura mea. Corinthians 10:31. Whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Romans 3:23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. John 3, 5 through 7, Jesus answered, Unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Amen. I lift my eyes into the hills. Where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the, my, the maker in heavens and the earth. Amen. Luke eleven twenty eight. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Luke eleven twenty eight. John three sixteen and seventeen. For God sent not in son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believed in him should not perish and have everlasting life. For God sent not in Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John three sixteen and seventeen. Amen. Good job. Acts sixteen, fifteen through seventeen. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, and placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all your many blessings name them one by one and it will surprise you what the lord has done count your blessings name them one by one count your blessings see what god has done count your blessings name them one by one Are you ever burdened with the load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one.
I encourage you all to be part of the gospel dream, at least here at Hosanna Christian Church. There are many ministries in which God can imprint on your heart the importance of even a dollar. A dollar puts rice in the belly of a hungry Filipino orphan. A dollar pays for a brick that goes to put up the walls for the churches that we're helping to plant. So if you guys buy a lot of stuff on Amazon, like unfortunately I do, at least I do it with Amazon Smile. I put that Hosanna Christian Church is my um, nonprofit organization. And every single time I bought that grill cover for 50 bucks, I think 50 cents or so, or a dollar, I don't know how much came to the Hosanna Fund in which Jeff Bezos, his company, is actually helping spread the gospel with monetary donations. Can you believe that? So please, if you can't, if you can't tithe, because times are tough, if you're going to buy that nice grill or whatever it is you're buying on Amazon, the least you can do is just pop in the church's name and they'll donate uh, every single quarter to the church and help us spread the gospel dream. Amen. I have a couple of announcements um, that I would like to make before we get into the sermon. Uh, the first being that if your children are in Sunday school, August 16th, which is two weeks from now, is going to be when we take the children and they'll have their verses that they memorized written out. And the Sunday school teachers, as well as some volunteers, will listen to the children to see, we call it a yearly Bible verse contest. And while we don't want to make it all for the prizes, it is exciting for the children. And we know that if we teach our children now, especially early, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will then forever throughout their lives, whether it's good times or bad times, remind them of the Word of God imprinted on their hearts. So mothers, fathers, grandparents, before they turn on that YouTube or that Netflix or before they run outside because they want to go on that hinta, sorry, swing, I got some words uh, that are only Romanian in our house, on that swing, let's get a couple of verses written down so that two weeks from now we're ready to go. That's the first announcement. The second announcement is that the Lord is bringing multiple people and families to our church without even us working for it. Um, unfortunately, we got to pray for Zach and his wife, Stephanie, who some of their children are sick and they couldn't make it this morning. But uh, I've been talking to the family and seeing their interest in the church and all these other things came up. And I noticed that the wife, Sister Stephanie, is um, very pro-homeschooling. And my wife and a couple other of the sisters in the church are also pro-homeschooling, especially now with the idea of the kids would have to go to school for half the day, half the day learning, half the day covered with a hazmat suit, half the day with whatever. What are we going to do? And so even if it's for a year or two years or, you know what, if it's a blessing to do it longer, uh, there are sisters here that either have been homeschooling or have an idea about homeschooling or have a passion to want to try it. So, I haven't asked any of the sisters if this is possible, but I would like, before the end of August, we'll talk about it more as time comes, maybe you'll get some texts or phone numbers, is that this church to be an open forum that one of these Sundays after the service, for the families to meet and discuss the pros, the cons, um, the systems or different types of people and curriculums you can buy, what's the best. And the beauty is that this church is probably 99% underutilized with the amount of classrooms we have here, with the amount of um, resources that are here, which the church could also open its doors and we can have some sort of setup. Now, this is just a dream, but if you're truly serious about it, why not? Why have one mom suffer or suffer, carry the burden of homeschooling when there's a lot of sisters out there that either have been doing it for years, and not just in this church. We'll make the announcement for, well, those other churches right now are closed, but I'm saying we'll make announcements because I think that it was probably maybe the most godly way where mom and dad are there teaching the children and not necessarily um, schools. But that's, you know, neither here nor there. So mothers, Fathers, if you're thinking about, do I send my kids back to school this fall? There's another option. Homeschooling is one of them. There's a lot of established Christians, established churches that help a lot of these families out. And I think that Hosanna Christian Church is growing, not just that small little Romanian nucleus, but it's growing a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger by the Spirit of God, not by our doing, because we're just doing the same thing over and over again, preaching the gospel, praying, and uh, being a light to people. And this is causing 
people to be interested. And I think that this place could be a beacon for homeschoolers, for families that are going through hard times. I've already said enough. You get the idea. Please, if you're interested, um, we'll have a slide during the announcements that rotate about this next week. And then we're thinking that before school starts, which is really soon, the end of August, um, we'll at least have this discussion where people can decide what they want to do with their children. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. I think that's the last of the announcement before we get into the sermon. You guys know, or at least we try, sometimes the tech team is a little bit behind, sometimes too, too a little bit of front in front, but at least everything that we try to do in this church from 1030 to 12 is to read the Bible and what it says to do, we do it. Brother Lemmy said that, you know, it says in Psalms 100 that we are to sing, we are to bless the Lord with our worship together corporately, which means that they don't sit up here and sound really good, even though they do, and you guys just sit back there and drink your coffee and eat popcorn. That's not what this is about. The Bible says all of us are to worship in song and thanksgiving. The Bible also says, we didn't have the verse up there, we'll try to be better at this, where it says that our time of community is not to give our kids all this acclamation, try to boast them up. It's actually for the church, where the Bible says that if there is a tongue, if there is a revelation, if there's a song, if there's a testimony, whatever it may be, if it builds up the church, that we should share it. And I'm a little bit upset that it's only children in the gospel dream. And once in a while, thank you, Sister Bia and Brother Chris, for coming up here with the song. But I know that the Lord is working on your guys' hearts, and you don't want to come up here and say it. The fact that this church is still open, when all of our, or most of our brother and sister churches that we have friends, family, cousins, uncles, whatever, that are closed, and by the grace of God, we're still open. And so this is a very interesting way of doing things because there's thousands of Romanians, let alone Americans and our friends, thousands, that on the first Sunday of the month, we take the Lord's Supper. And can they? Well, some people don't like the idea that I say that we can take it together, whether you're at home sick in quarantine of COVID or whether you're on a truck, on a semi-driver, far away from home hearing this message today or five years from now, but I'm going to teach and I'm going to preach and until you show me something biblically that we can't do this, is that when we pray, the pastors, the presbyters, the ordained over the bread and the juice, that you, wherever you are in your home, in your trailer, in your quarantine or in your hospital bed, take what you have and pray when the elders pray and take it the way they ask us to take it. And therefore, the Lord's Supper is not defined by this building, but it is a large table where we're not designing this is the rules. The people from Africa to Asia to Romania are already doing this. We're just pulling up a chair, and God is the one who is feeding us his life. And so, get ready. If you don't have the stuff, you still have time. It's a little bit of flour, oil, water. And if you can't do that, grab whatever you can. Because the element itself is not the most important thing. Though it has the value of the body and the blood of Christ. Together, remembering what Jesus did. And then partaking of it together is what it was designed for. Now, you guys might not agree with me, but for now, that's what we're doing. You know that in the Bible, we try talking about, well, okay, we talked about why do we sing? Why do we have a time of community to build each other up? We also have a time for preaching or teaching, or in the Bible, there's many ways of saying that, dedicated to the apostles, teaching, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, studying the Old Testament, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then, at the end of our services, we have another biblical command which is for us to pray together you sing together you're learning together why not pray together a commandment of god now some people don't understand this some people don't sing together some people just they don't sing and some people sing quiet and some people sing loud some people sing in their mind some people sing off key some people sing very nicely but the commandment to worship god and thanksgiving is still a commandment and so we encourage you to sing the commandment for us to pray together is from the Bible. And so whether you pray quiet, whether you've never heard someone pray out loud, this place is a place where we like to call a house of prayer. 
And so the reason we do what we do here, the reason the songs are sung, the reason the children show that out of the mouths of babes, they can worship the Lord with memorizing verses, with solos, with songs, with preaching. The only reason we do this is so that you can respond to the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer at the end of the service. That's it. Some services, they end as soon as the sermon says amen, and sometimes we're on fire and we're like, yeah, that was such a great sermon, I want to, and then it's like, okay, time for lunch. And we're like, oh, okay. But we want to incorporate this more and more into our church service that we end, that we culminate everything in which the Spirit of God. Right now, you might think, oh, he's not talking to me, but he is. And he's not here, but he is. And he's not next to me, but he is. Going through the benches, going through the broadcast, going through wherever this voice is heard. The Spirit of God is working for you. And so I had for the longest time, because we've been going through the sermon series of how to study the Bible, I started with Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I hope that at least the children in their Bible verse contest, well, they're at Sunday school, so they didn't hear me say it, but at least the parents have memorized the reason which we teach out of the Word of God, which was do not conform to the world and be renewed by the transforming of your mind. But this week, I'm changing it up a little bit. I'm changing it up a little bit. I have two verses here, actually three, on why and what we teach here from the pulpit. Romans chapter 8, verses 6 and 7 says, For to set your mind, your importance, your desires on the things of the flesh, on the things of this world, on the things that incorporate greed and jealousy and lust and covetousness, is death. But to set your mind on the Spirit, to set your mind on the Holy Spirit of God, on the gospel of Jesus Christ, on the Word, the Bible, the Scriptures, is life and peace, the Bible says, which is why we're teaching in a way in which your mind can think on the things of the Spirit and not of the world. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. They hate God. God. For it does not submit to the law of God, the Bible of God, the scripture of God, the consciousness in which God has put on our hearts. Indeed, it cannot. And the second part in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing, or for those who don't know Jesus, or those who don't know the gospel, but to us who do. We are being saved Sorry, who are being saved? It is the power of God. So you're coming to church, and in the eyes of everyone else out there, what you're doing here is foolish. Singing to someone who you don't see, worshiping, giving for someone who you can't hear. It's all in your imagination, they might say. Whatever makes you feel better. Because teaching from the word of God, the way we will, makes you a fool in their eyes. You come to church to be made a fool. Now, if what you believe agrees with everything that happens out there, maybe you're not reading right. You know, normally I don't get into politics and I try not to. This is a pulpit. But sometimes you have to and... Sometimes if they consistently go against the gospel of Jesus Christ, I have to say time out. Time out. And we have to talk about it. And those verses bring up what I want to talk about. Because you think that this world is just A-OK, -okay, brother. Yahoo Sports has this headline. Jonathan Isaac, he's an NBA player from the Orlando Magic. His protest, this is the title, could have been applauded if his explanation was it nonsense. Not because he didn't want to start a riot and because people don't usually click, they just read headlines and move to the next one and don't actually read the article. He would have wrote because his explanation is nonsense, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, this young man decided that he was not going to kneel during the national anthem and that his way of protesting 
wasn't through just wearing a t-shirt or free to have his own opinion, right? And you can debate that and argue that. But the thing that I cannot, and you cannot as a believer of Christ, cannot debate is that he says this. I believe for myself that and my life has been supported through the gospel, through the image of God and all of God's glory. We all do things we shouldn't do. We hate those we shouldn't. I don't think kneeling or putting on a t-shirt for me personally is the answer. Black lives are supported throughout the gospel. We all have things that we do wrong. Whose wrong is worse? We all fall short of God's glory. He actually preached a message in which we talked about in Resurrection Sunday. And the response was this. The reporter says, he's 22, so there should be a space for grace. I don't think they know what that word means. And for growth. And he should seek it. It's not necessarily a youthful indiscretion, believing what he believes, like using illegal drugs or being caught driving while intoxicated. But it is a learning moment for him because his line of thinking is dangerous. You want me to go back to the slides that we talked about? Oh, the Bible is outdated. The Bible is not timely. The Bible is in a different culture. Those verses are coming true when I just looked and opened my Yahoo News on the first article that popped up. I wasn't even looking for it. So he could have been applauded if any reason for him protesting was anything but Christ. Hostile to God? Hmm. Guys, there's a reason in which I believe we're going through these sermon series, teaching us how to pray. And if you haven't heard or you haven't seen, they're on YouTube, go backwards because that's the fundamental. And then after teaching you how to pray and what the Bible says to pray, how to study the Bible, because who knows, this church might be closed. And then we're stuck at home and we're in quarantine and we don't know, pastor, where's the ordained, where's the people to serve us? And whether you're the man of the house or whether there is no man of the house and you're the sister of the house, it is your place to then be the priest or the priestess in your house. And so we've been studying and last time, before Easter Sunday, Easter in July, because that was a special dedicated thing where we said we cannot praise God on Easter in the spring with an empty church and everyone just watches online in their PJs and their coffee. So the leadership said, let's do it again and let's bring everybody in. And I believe that the Lord spoke and was present, whether it was through the mouths of babes. And so I want to refresh your memory a little bit. Back two weeks ago, two weeks ago, and so, whether or not you have a degree in theology or in many of the other ways through biblical studies, you will come to a class that is called hermeneutics. And I labeled it 101, but it's even less than that. It's about how you study the scriptures. And so we talked about two weeks ago the importance of knowing the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. And those are big words. But what do they mean? Exegesis is that you interpret the text, so the Bible in which you have either in your hand or in the app on your phone, you interpret that text through the analysis of the content that is in there. What the Spirit of God originally was going to say through the author, whether it's a prophet, an evangelist, apostle, through that offer, through that author in that phrase, chapter, or verse. Eisegesis is different is that I have a preconceived notion that I'm allowed to hit my wife or hit my children or I'm allowed to have a third, fourth, and fifth wife or that I'm allowed to not evangelize or talk to people about Jesus. And you have these ideas and so you come with these ideas to the Bible and then you look for bits and pieces to support your corrupt thinking. Now, it's, it's impossible. We're all biased to one sort or to another, whether left, right, up, or down, whether you're American, Romanian, Arabic, Korean, Filipino. We have tendencies to read the Bible through a biased lens, which is why we started the first lesson on how to read the Bible, is to do it with the guidance counselor through prayer with the Holy Spirit, where we say, I could have been wrong for 50 years, Lord, but teach me what it truly means. That takes a humble heart. Studying the Bible is not easy. 
And so those two key differences tell us in a way on how we read the word. We have to read it all through its context. And I can't bring my Baptist background to it. I can't bring my Pentecostal background to it. I can't bring my female, my male, my husband, my wife. Because if you read those verses specifically for those, you can attack your husband. You can attack your wife. You can attack your denomination. And like I said last time, some of the worst atrocities on the face of this planet have been done in the name of God and in the name of the Holy Scriptures. I don't want to be known for taking the Bible out of context for my own personal self-gain. I want God to define who God is, me to humble myself for that. And if I am told and articles are written about me that I am crazy, so be it. They did much, much worse to the man named Jesus. I could only expect the same. And so should you. So studying the Bible is extremely important. I know we can't come with it without any biases, but like I said, this is why studying the Bible is work. This is why the Bible says to do your best. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not COVID. It's just when you talk a lot, <coughs> your, your, your throat gets dry. I have water here. You guys don't have to run away. I have to do that every time. Every time I sneeze from allergies or whatever, when I'm at Kroger, uh, people run. So I'm just letting you know. Um. Again, we talked about not just those two things, but the idea of knowing the difference between interpretation and application. The idea is sometimes we could fall into the danger of going to Bible studies and we say, what do you believe this verse means? And while the approach isn't wrong, it's Deadly if that's the only approach in which we have. Because that is good to talk about, to see that we can learn from other people, to come to a single conclusion because the interpretation of the text that is in the Bible is designed and written by God. We've had sermon series in which we've said many examples where God told his prophets, write this down. So it's not the prophet's words, it's the words of God. And so we know that God is the one who wrote down these words, and God defines what it's written. Now, the application could be different for a lot of us. So interpretation is asking what the passage is saying and what it means. Well, application is saying, how do I apply this in my time, in my culture, in my specific situation? Ultimately, each passage has one meaning, but it might have different applications. You see, the study of Scripture is so important because we're going to do a little bit of hermeneutics now. We talked about a lot of theory, a lot of how do we do this, a lot of how do we, and now we're going to apply it in two ways. One, a very verse that we pull out of context, and the second one is going to be about the Lord's Supper. We have it here. We're going to talk about it, but I don't want to talk about it from my American approach, my Romanian approach, my Baptist or Catholic approach to the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion, one of the most holy acts a Christian could do. And here we have open communion, which means that if you have been baptized in water and have a covenant with the Lord Jesus, that you are open to partake with us. So we're going to get into all of this. You're going to see exegesis, eisegesis if we're wrong, interpretation and application. Guys, studying the Bible is so important, and there's a reason that we've been like almost three months on the same topic. So give an example, Brother Chris. Sounds good. There are tons of books if you go into a Christian bookstore. There are tons of posts on Pinterest and Instagram and whatever social media that you're part of that has this verse and I'm sure you could buy even a t-shirt with it. I should have bought one. I didn't have the chance. Maybe I'll do it on Amazon and then give 5% to the gospel dream. Hint, hint. Okay, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Do you guys know this verse? Okay. I, I want to make sure because before we dive into it, you're, if you're like, I have no idea about this verse, then it kind of ruins the whole setup. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, and... Reading this verse by itself, in isolation, we can interpret this in all the different ways in which our heart 
or our current situation takes us to. For I know the plans I have for you. This is God speaking to his people, declares the Lord, for plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Wow. We serve an amazing God. Amen. And then we go home. And everyone can take that verse however they want. Plans to prosper you. So all those lottery tickets that you're buying, good job. All the casino runs you're doing so that you're wealthy and healthy and good job. Keep doing that. My big house, my nice cars. I lose money, I gain money. I can't lose money because it says here the Bible obviously has plans for me to prosper me. So I can't lose any money. I can only gain things. I can't lose children. I can't get cancer. I can't fill in the blank. And so people have a difficult time understanding who God is. And if they have a shallow conversion, they'll read this verse and they'll see that their life is not prosperous. They'll see that their life is filled with harm. And they'll see that there is no hope or perceived future for them. And then they'll say, the Bible is full of contradictions because there are Christians in the Middle East, young women who are trafficked, who are Christians, who are beheaded or raped or, or they commit suicide because they can't take being raped 10, 15, 20 times a day for months on end. Christian sisters, well, that verse doesn't apply to them. So if we're not careful, if we don't bring our own, remember eisegesis? Where we bring our own preconceived notions of this is what that verse has to mean. No, 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 no. That's you defining what God wrote for that specific verse. That's not God teaching you and revealing through you through the Spirit of God the context of that verse. And trust me, this is not the only verse. I've been on interest. I've been on Pinterest and Instagram long enough to see these verses. And so let's, let's, let's take a look. Let's do all the things that we talked about. Let's look at interpretation. Let's look at application. Let's look at all these things. Let's look at context historically. We all talked about these verses, sorry, about these sermon series. I can't go through all of them. I can't recap all of them. Please, if you don't, take them out of order because then you'll take a sermon out of context. And then that's a whole big problem. Take it in steps. You see, Jeremiah was writing this when the Jewish people were in exile in Babylon. This wasn't when everything was perfect, the temple was great, King David was, you know, throwing grapes everywhere and dancing and praising God and, you know, doing the whole thing. This wasn't a time of peace. This was a time of suffering. A lot of young men, especially Daniel and his friends, those who were the fit ones, those who were, who were royalty or noble blood or those who, who uh, were wise, students were of top priority for the emperor. And so those young men were all castrated because they were going to be in the courts of the king and the queen. <laughs> it's a very bad day. It's a very bad period of time. This isn't just one day. This is over the course of what we read in the Bible, 70 years. So we see here that they're going through grueling times. They don't even live at home. They're not even in their own house in which their grandparents or their parents probably gave them, in which they had ideas, in which they had dreams of seeing their own children grow up and play in the hills of parts of Israel and Jerusalem. They had gone into captivity. Why? As punishment for their lack of faith in God. Jeremiah told them that they would be in captivity for 70 years. People say, why 70 years? It's very simple. The Bible says for these people that every seven years, you have to give one year off in the land. Don't make money off of it. Don't plant anything. Let the land rest, kind of like that one day that we have the Sabbath. Okay, let it rest. And these people said, no, I'm going to keep working on that day because I'm going to make money. Take that lesson however you want. And so God was merciful if it took 70 years to reclaim the debt. That means every, 70, every seven years, one year, they occurred a debt to God 70 times seven. 
So God was graceful. God was merciful for 490 years. You know, when my kid doesn't do the, the, the thing I ask him to after like half a second, psh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm Romanian. My, maybe my English will allow me to extend that to a second. But the Lord is so generous, so merciful, so slow to anger, not only with his people, but with me and with you. He waited 490 years of their rebellion, of not listening to them to say, that's it, time's up. And guess what? It's not like he said, time's up, and I'm going to banish you forever. No, he says, you'll pay your debt. You'll pay your 70 years, and then this verse comes into play. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God's promise he did do this for his people because after 70 years, these people were restored back to their land. You see, if we read this with different biases, we think of this as a blank check. A promise from God that nothing bad will ever happen to any of us. That's not the case. God allows us to go through trials and tribulation to test us, to, to, to purify us, to grow us in our faith. If you're going through a really simple life on cruise control, we got a problem. And so people love this verse because they can interpret it that God will say that forever they will keep them safe and forever they will bless them. That's not the case. So we got to read things in context with the entire history which has played out in the Bible. You don't read Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 by itself. You read the whole chapter. You read the verses afterwards. You bring it together. You ask questions because before you come to the conclusion that God will never allow me to suffer, God will never allow me to not prosper, just wait a week. And then where's your faith? You guys, I don't want this church, I don't want the people hearing this message to have a shallow faith in the gospel, in the, in the word of God. I want it to be deep and rooted in his word. But to do that, you have to understand what it says. I wish I could tell you that this verse says that you're going to be blessed, you're going to have a huge house, and you're never going to get sick. But that's not what it is. You know, we can see observations of God's compassion in the story of Jeremiah and of the people. We can trust that same compassion God has for us today. But that compassion wasn't a free blank check for them to do whatever they wanted. It was a promise that even when things get bad, when you lose your house, when you go in a far off country, when you can't see your family anymore, when you're separated, God has plans for you. You think they look big and mighty, but for him, his ways are different than our ways. The plan for Stephen, one of the only people in the Bible besides Jesus, to be mentioned specifically how he dies. That is a big honor. No one else. Peter, Paul, you know, John. How did he die? I don't know. Tradition tells us. But Stephen is called out. And the will of God, the glory of God for Stephen's life was for him to show to proclaim the message of God, and then to get a rock to the head. And he was ecstatic to do so. I see the Lord. He saw the vision of God. The heavens opened up. He was ready to go. He fell asleep before the first rock came. And that was the will of God for his life, and he loved it. And some of us, you know, we get laid off. Or our salaries get reduced 25%. And we think, oh, God is no longer with us. Come on. Let's build our relationship, our knowledge, our understanding of the word of God. But again, we can't do that unless we study the proper way. And this is just one example, one verse. Today we have the Lord's Supper in front of us. What does that mean, Chris? Okay. We're going to take it seriously. I mean, we always do, but because... We're going to take it seriously. The Bible says about the Lord's Supper in chapter, sorry, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this about the Lord's Supper. And we're going to do what we did about Jeremiah's verse. We're going to do with these verses. And I am at a predicament here because once we see these verses outside of the lens of what we've been reading and thinking forever, 
I'm at this tension with, do we cancel the Lord's Supper? My one desire, the reason in which I fight to get many people, whether you're in this church, whether you're in a sick bed, whether you're on your truck, whether you're at work, to take communion with us together, as many people as possible, because there's so much life in the Lord's Supper, the Bible says that if you don't have it, you don't have life in you. And so from me as a preacher, I have to encourage, I have to help convict, I have to help uh, bring up people to see where they've been and then to repent and come and take the Lord's Supper. I have to do that. That's, that's my desire, that's my passion for all of you. No one to come into this church and walk out. And say, no, 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 the Lord's Supper is not for me. But then when I read the Bible and I read this verse, I realize that. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, says Paul, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given things, he broke it. Just like his body was broken for me and for you and for all of humanity, not because it was to be condemned, but because our lives and our souls and our families and our friends and our culture was meant to be saved and redeemed. This is my body, Jesus says, which is for you. Not because you're Romanian, not because you're Jewish, not because you're American, not because you speak in tongues, not because you don't speak in tongues. It is for you if you believe in what Jesus' words are saying. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I have it highlighted in red twice because Jesus, when he repeats something, is explicitly calling out the importance of what he's saying. Remember my, my, the sacrifice on the cross. Remember how I was betrayed. Remember how I was beaten. All for you. You see, this does something. There's a reason Jesus says to remember this holy act. There's a reason in which we desire to have Easter Sunday in July again for us to remember the cross as much as humanly possible. Adam and Eve is great. The cross is better. Noah and the flood is great. The cross is better. Isaiah, Jeremiah, King David, David and Goliath, all these stories are great. The cross, the story of what happened there for me and for you is the best good news and that's why we have to remember because when we remember what happened at the cross something happens inside of us or does it for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup highlighted here you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of Christ. Let a person therefore examine himself and then after he is examined, so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Paul reveals another purpose for observing the Lord's Supper. It is a proclamation not only that Jesus died for the sins of all who trust in him, but it is a proclamation in the promise that Christ will one day come again. Until he comes, the Bible says here. It's not just about the fact that he died for us, it's the fact that he's coming. Jesus is coming back. If not now, I don't know, I mean... Whatever, don't go into the conspiracy theories on the Romanian chat rooms, but what I'm saying, it gets more and more and more like he's coming back. And so if he's coming back, do we tell anybody about it? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The Lord's Supper is not validation for my moral goodness. But we treat it that way. I kept the Ten Commandments. I didn't yell at my kids this morning. I fasted for a couple days before here. Good things. I'm happy that you don't yell at your kids. I'm happy you don't yell at your spouse. I'm happy that you fast multiple days for the glory of God, not for yourself, and come to church like that. I'm happy. That is great. But the Lord's Supper, 
The Lord did not die. The Lord did not break his body and spill his blood for you to be a good, normal Christian. So here we go. Let's examine ourselves then, right? We want to do what the Bible says. The Bible says, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. My question for you and for me, trust me, this is hard. This hurt me. This kept me up at night is the fact that is the only time I proclaim the death of God when I take communion is the only time I speak of the love of God, of the sacrifice of Jesus, not with my neighbor, not with my parents, not with my friends, not with my coworker, but when I'm here. That's the only time. Shame on me. And I think I'm worthy. I think I'm worthy to come here because I didn't tell a lie this week or because I fasted or I did things in my own power. But when the Lord comes and tells me in multiple places in the Bible, and we call ourselves Pentecostal, some of us, that we're infused and we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, this is, should be us. You really want to examine yourself? Let's use the Bible. Let's not use Romanian tradition, American tradition, where we come here and take communion and we get out the door. No, let's really examine ourselves. Therefore, go out and make disciples to all nations. Me, you, 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 you listening. This is for you. God is commanding you, just like he told you, don't steal, don't lie, don't kill, don't covet. Guess what? He also said a different commandment, one that says, go into the world and preach the gospel. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I commanded you. Examination number one, have you been going out to your friends, to your neighbors, to your coworker, to the people who are across the street, and have you been telling them about Christ? But seek first the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God comes first. Kingdom of God. Then his righteousness and then all the other things shall be given unto you. The kingdom of God. If you are heavenly and kingdom minded, you're looking to expand the kingdom to save as many people. To tell them that they're in the brink of almost falling in eternity in hell. But you love them so much that you have to in some way. Whether it's through actions, whether it's through words, whether it's through a combination of whatever the Holy Spirit puts on your heart. You must tell people about Christ. Have you? So to me it's sinking deeper and deeper because brothers and sisters, I do not commend myself for saying, Well I preach on Sundays and so I'm scot-free. No, I haven't done these things. Jesus replied, you will receive my power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Why? And you will be my witnesses. You'll talk to everyone you see in the marketplace, on the street, at the gas station, to your kids, to your grandparents, to your friends. Whether you get fired or not, or whether your name gets plastered all over Yahoo News, that you're an idiot. You stand up for the gospel of Christ. We're not doing this. So then, no, I can't come in a worthy manner. You can't come in a worthy manner. No one can come in a worthy manner to take part of what Christ sacrificed for because we just live a normal, moral, acceptable life. But in the ways in which God calls us to tell everyone that we are in, I mean, it should even be a commandment. We should love God. Remember? Remember me. Remember me. Remember me when you take this. Remember me. When you remember Christ, you realize how good he is and how he has to be shared. Whether they slap something across your mouth or put you in jail. Which, guess what? They're already doing that to Christians. But we go to the same table as them, right? We go to the same table as them. At them. Yeah. When they take China, when they get out of prison, when they're beaten, when they kill their kids, when they kill their wives, and they're taking the Lord's body and blood and having the Lord's supper, we're okay too, right? We're good because we cleansed ourselves. We didn't lie. We didn't cheat this week. How, how am I going to take this? How am I going to take this one? And it scares me because how long have I been taking China? Because the Bible says, sorry, the Lord's Supper, because the Bible says that if I take it in an unworthy manner, then I'm guilty. And just because I lived a good Ten Commandment life, but I never said once in all these years about Jesus, I took China the entire time unworthy. I took the Lord's Supper unworthy because I was scared to talk about Christ. Who cares if you didn't covet and, and you didn't lie, you didn't cheat, you didn't steal, you didn't murder. You never opened your mouth once about Christ. 
And so we're all unworthy. Whether or not you believe what I'm saying, whether or not you're seeing the depth of teaching in these verses, the beauty about remembering Jesus is that there were plenty of people that nailed his hands to the cross, plenty of people that spit on him, plenty of the people that beat him, and he still forgave them, and his grace and his mercy was still for them. And whether you've been taking the Lord's Supper unworthy for years because you never opened your mouth once about Christ, he's willing to forgive you for that. And that's the beauty of having a time that is dedicated to respond to him. I'm not saying amen and we're going home. That's not the case. I'm saying amen and then we're going to pray. And then you can pray to God however you want on your knees, standing up, hands up, crying, murmuring five seconds or, or for 500 minutes. I don't care what it is. It has to come across that, Lord, I today wanted to search myself. And then I realized that when we read the word of God, that the... Lord's Supper is not just about being morally acceptable to society or to my wife or to my kids. It's to you. And so the beauty is, is that all of us who have just completely obliterated by ignoring commands of the word of God, Jesus is still there. He's not like me and you where you wrong me or wrong you and then uh, don't worry about it, forget it. I'm never hanging out with you, I'm never talking to you, I'm deleting you off Instagram, Snapchat, whatever. No, no, Jesus is not like us. He is greater than anything we could comprehend. He is more merciful than we ever think. He is more graceful than we could ever imagine. He loves you more than you even love yourself. And he's asking you to come together now in this examination hour of prayer to come together to pray, to ask the Lord for forgiveness, for real forgiveness, not because I wasn't quote unquote a nominal Christian, because I never opened my mouth about the most important thing that you did with your life, die on a cross for me and for you. So let's stand please. If you're at home, if you're watching this, this is now when it's time where we examine ourselves. We truly examine ourselves. Where we ask the Lord for forgiveness. Where we ask, Lord, please forgive us because I want to have fellowship with you. I want to have part of the body and the blood and, and, and to be at that table with, with legions of Christians all over the world who today or multiple days are at that table. So let's examine ourselves with true repentance and then when we're done, when we're done, the pastor and the elders will break the elements and pray for the elements. And then I beg of you, whatever it is that your sin is holding back, whether it's the fact that you think, I can't take this. Brother Chris has told me that I, I haven't opened my mouth about Jesus for years and I've been taking China. It doesn't matter. God can forgive even that. But you have to do it with your own mouth, with your own mind. I can't do it for you. I can't say, pray this prayer and God will forgive you. No, no, no. You need to do it. And so, please, I'm begging you at this time, let us come together in prayer. And then when we are done, like I said, the brothers will come and pray for the elements. You who are at home, pray with us as well. You who are wherever you may be, grab whatever elements you may have. And please, don't run away from the table of God. But come and be part of his family. Amen. Dear oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for today.